to use a microphone a little bit just because I think people are st uh, streaming over there. Uh, we'll get we'll get started. Um, I think we I think the schedule is uh, about an hour for this, and then we then there's a little time for for lunch or something like that afterwards. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a project called Postgres XP. So uh, StormDB is a, a database as a service company, and we base all our technology off of Postgres XC. Um, so that's that's why we're we've been using it for a couple years now. Our a, a couple of our, our developers were, were the original architects of Postgres XC, along with the folks out in Japan over at NTT. Um, you know, they they definitely have the scalable database problem. You know, they're primarily a Oracle shop, paying Oracle a tremendous amount of money, um, and they're looking to use open source software in order to be able to save on a lot of that. And for some of their databases, when you're a telecom, they just have huge scalability problems, and they need to be able to scale beyond a single server. Um, and that, that's really what they were trying to accomplish with Postgres XC. Uh, I'm also the, the organizers over in New York City and Philly for the Postgres users group. So uh, we, we actually had a, a nice meeting over at Philly uh, the other day um, where the, the guys over at Meet Me, who used to be my yearbook, um, talked about how they scale Postgres out to like 40 different servers. And I said, well, well why don't you use Postgres XC? It, it just it wasn't ready at the time for them. Um, but I encourage, if anybody here is local, um, go to the LA Pug meetings whenever you have them. Um, down in San Diego, I know... Joe tries to, to run them every every now and then. I know he's kind of busy, but um, it's a great way to find the local Postgres talent, be able to interact with them. Um, we, we've, New York has been exploding over the last couple years, and we just started up Philly about six months ago. Um, and it's just incredible the number of people that are using Postgres inside of Philly. Um, I, I've gone to a lot of meetings in Philly, never realized how big it really was until we started organizing the group. And now, on a monthly basis, we're having 40 people show up to meetings um, and just talking about Postgres in the city. It's just kind of getting a nice buzz where we're getting pulled into other tech groups uh, just to talk about Postgres, so like the local Python groups and other things like that are asking us to go come talk about Postgres at those different groups. So I encourage you, if you're here, get involved. If you're in a different city, look for another uh, Postgres users group. It is a, uh, a huge benefit to yourself and to the local community in order just to get everybody together and eat pizza once, once a month and just talk about Postgres. Um, so basically what XC, um, it is a, like I said, a fork of Postgres. It's the current version that out there is based on Postgres 9.1. Um, and the goal is to be able to have a, essentially a drop-in replacement for most of what you could do in Postgres but be, have it be able to scale beyond a single server. Right, so we were just having a little debate before, is it multi-master? And I you know, said, no, it's symmetric, <laughs> kind of what that means. Um, it's essentially this way you could have multiple servers all appear as a single Postgres database. Um, it's not a high availability solution, it's a scalability solution. For high availability, we have to do other things. Um, and when you look at it kind of all drawn out, it kind of looks like some of those NoSQL databases, the way that they could just have all these peers with one another. The, but the big thing is, is for Postgres, we're not giving up consistency, right? So you're not going to have that eventually consistent model. Um, we're, everything is ASCII compliant. It's not like, oh, we're, we're going to try to track somebody's inventory in there, 
and all of a sudden you oversold your, your stock because you didn't have a consistent view of how much data uh, inventory you had in there. It's, it behaves like a regular Postgres database. This is basically what it looks like on an architectural diagram. Right? So you could have some sort of load balancer in front of it, it or you could just e connect to each one of those coordinators, and they're all peers. They all are, are exactly the same. One could disappear, you could spin up another one, they're all exactly the same. Um, sorry? Then, then we have uh, the global transaction manager, which we'll get into, is really the brains behind making sure you have the consistency across everything. And then you have multiple data nodes down at the bottom where your data is ultimately stored. There's really no data stored inside those coordinators, just some simple metadata. And we'll dig into what all those little things are. And the, the scalability, what we find, is on a TPCW type test, which has uh, a, a lot of uh, consistency requirements. Is really a DBT1. Okay. <laughs> sure. So the, the TPCW is essentially trying to model, model an e-commerce website. Um, so this way you do have to model things like inventory and make sure that you do have stock and everything in the right places. Um, we, we're seeing about a 0.6x scalability factor, which is nowhere near the one which, we, which you want to have for perfectly linear scalability. But when you want to be able to scale uh, beyond a single box, you, you definitely this is the way to do it for a test like that. Um, there's definitely things that we could do in the future that could get that to probably more like 0.8x is probably where we could see it theoretically with this architecture going. Um, but it's definitely something that you could see that could scale pretty well. Um, I, I have seen workloads where it is, everything's kind of perfectly spread out and there's no dependencies across the data nodes. It does scale pretty close to linearly. Um, but for that, things where you have cross node joins and we'll get into what those things are, um, there you do have that issue of you don't get perfectly linear scalability. So where, where we traditionally have seen this work well um, are on traditional SQL applications, um, around websites, uh, things like a Drupal website, which does some crazy things that when you bring up the front page, if you, you don't turn on caching, it makes a, a hundred database requests, kind of all to paint the home page. It just kind of overloads the database pretty quick. Um, but they're all really primary key lookups. They all happen really fast. Um, Postgres XC is perfect for those sorts of things. You can sca scale your reads fairly linearly, uh, that type of thing. Um, geospatial type queries are really taking, can take advantage of this. The, the geospatial data is usually fairly big, and working on it is very CPU intensive. So you want to be able to use multiple machines and be able to scale that out beyond, the, say, four, or eight, or 16 cores that might be on a single box. You could put 10 inexpensive commodity machines together and run it across 40 CPUs. Um, or if you really wanted to get into the NoSQL stuff, but you still like Postgres, you could essentially have a distributed key value store of being able to spread that out across multiple machines like, like the, the React or Cassandra type things. So for PostGIS, uh, things like fleet tracking, um, where you have a constant stream of data points and they need to be validated as they're being inserted, you have some sort of constraint as it's being checked in. You see when it's basically being fed in, in near real time, the CPUs on a single box just kind of peg. Um, Postgres XC is perfect for that sort of thing. Um, or you could do more complex queries on there of being able to scale it. And you, you do simple parallelization across the multiple machines. Um, things like sums do it real, uh, are parallelized really well. So if you did a sum and you had 10 servers inside your, your Postgres XC uh, cluster, it'll actually run 10 times as fast. So distributed key value store, if you're using the, the Postgres H store data type, you wanted to look like a NoSQL database and still run some SQL, you can do that sort of thing and be able to scale that. So why would it be right? Is if you do need right scalability, that's primarily what it is. If you like the acid, um, which is important to a lot of people, if you like SQL, um, if you don't want to rewrite your applications, if you're, you're hitting some scalability threshold inside of Postgres and buying bigger and bigger machines isn't necessarily the right thing to do, um, where you could run it with 10 $3,000 machines instead of one $300,000 machine, that sort of thing, it, it, you know, if you're, you fit into the right use case. 
Um, or if you want to be able to leverage a lot of the existing Postgres stuff out there. Most of the functions work fine um, because it just runs it all locally on the coordinator and pushes it down. Um, there are a couple of them that doesn't all work right. Uh, yeah, they, they, f they work fine as long as you're not inserting, well even then when you're inserting data, it runs it all locally on the coordinator and whatever the result is, it pushes it down. So it may not be very efficient. You might have to do some tweaks and be able to push those functions down uh, onto the data nodes and, and do that. That's one of the things we're trying to figure out for 1.1 is more efficiently say, you run this, this function on the coordinator and this one on the data nodes and being able to tell. Um, right now it's all runs on the coordinator which sometimes is really slow. It basically does automatic sharding for okay. you. Um, so this way, if you have a, a large number of inserts of data, you might spread off a billion inserts across 10 machines, and each one of them has their own wall logs running in parallel and keeping track of all that. So this way, that's usually what the bottleneck is for high write scale scalability is with your wall. This way, you could have 10 walls instead of one. Why it might not be right? If you want to use this for some sort of data warehouse, to, to, there's some basic parallelization in there, um, but it really isn't meant for big, complex analytical queries. Um, there's a, a different project called Stato. I presented it at this conference last year, um, that if you want to have something like the, the big Teradata, Greenplum type things, but fully open source, um, this does a lot of that for you. It does pretty well on a TPCH, which is the, the data warehousing um, benchmark. If you need something with built-in high availability, it, um, you have to roll your own high availability with Postgres XD. Well, uh, you, say you, roll high with you do, you do, but now you're just increasing the complexity a lot, right? So instead of just having a simple uh, active standby failover with clustering or something like that, you have to do that across ten machines instead of two. Right? Um, you know, it's definitely, yeah. I, I, there's some cool techniques for doing it, and I'll, we'll get to that at the end of, of how we do it. Um, but it, is, it just adds a layer of complexity to it. It doesn't have things like React, which automatically handles when one of the machines go down, it automatically you know, doesn't care. Um, it really doesn't care about where the data goes. Um, you know, it's, it's not in there. Um, or if you just want to use NoSQL, don't use this. So the different components, there's really three different layers. There's the coordinators, the data nodes, and the global transaction manager. This could all run on a single machine, um, run it on my laptop all the time, um, or it could be spread off across dozens of machines, depending on what your needs are. The coordinators um, really are the main entry point. So when you connect to a Postgres XC cluster, you're connecting to a coordinator. You could have one coordinator, you could have 20 coordinators. They're all peers of one another. So uh, what we do when we run into production, we generally put some sort of load balancer in front of it. So this way, it'll uh, at least round robin the, the, the connections across everything. Um, or you could connect to each one of them however you like. And, uh, between a coordinator and a data node, it's pretty noisy. You, we, we generally set that up on its own isolated network. Yeah. Um, you know, we've done some tests that when you run InfiniBand between it, it does improve performance. Are you definitely not one coordinator No, no, no. This is uh, meant to be all run in the same same data center as close as possible. Um, it's meant, yeah, yeah. It does run across there, but I wouldn't recommend that. Um, if you're Depending on how your app is, it, it's like you could control where the data goes. You can do that where you could connect locally and you could do it almost as a federated data source 
it wasn't built for that. Um, there are some people that are trying to do that, but you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because really where all the communication is is with that global transaction manager, um, and that has to be in one place. Um, that's your single version of the truth. Um, and what, could the, what the coordinators do is it takes in the SQL query, it, it parses it and it plans it, and then it hands it off to the data node. So that's really where all the brains are from the optimization standpoint is. It also interacts with the gl uh, global transaction manager to get uh, any transaction IDs it might need or snapshots it might need. Um, and then if it has to write out the data, it's going to handle that with through the two-phase commits out to the data nodes. Um, and it also stores all the metadata information. The data nodes are, are mostly vanilla Postgres. Uh, there's a little bit of changes to it. Essentially, this way, it's take it where it could take in the transaction IDs coming in from the coordinator instead of generating its own transaction IDs. But that's really the only major changes between vanilla Postgres and a, a Postgres XC data node. That's where your data is all stored. Um, it you only connect to it front through a, a coordinator. You, know, you can connect to it with PSQL, and you try to run something, you'll get some error message saying it doesn't have a global snapshot. Um, but you know, essentially, what it, the only time you really want to connect to it is through a coordinator, because otherwise you could really hose up your data. But that's really where all most of the work is done and all the data is stored. And the global transaction manager is really what gives you that consistency. Um, it's, it's based off the, the Postgres proc array code. It's basically taken and turned that into its own, own process. Uh, it's multi-threaded. Um, and that's where it's handling generating the transaction IDs, generating the snapshots for the entire cluster. Things like timestamps, when you wanted to get the, the current timestamp, it's pulled from the global transaction manager and your sequences. Really, anything that has to be consistent across the entire cluster, it's all pulled through there. So this is why, um, where you don't want it geographically diver, uh, dispersed, it's because everybody has to talk back to this global transaction manager um, in order to be able to get all that information. We can, there's a thing called a, a GTM proxy that you could run that'll bunch up a bunch of requests and be able to make the, the communication back to the GTM a little less chatty. Um, so if you want to go from, say, LA to San Diego, you might be able to do something like that if you, if you have a fairly low latency stuff with, with using a GTM proxy. But even then, I wouldn't really recommend it. Yeah, yeah. It's essentially, you're just starting up the GTM in a different, with a different uh, command line module. Uh, so it's, I forget what the exact thing is, the proxy or something like that in order to start up with the proxy. Um, but the idea is, so this way, whenever your co one of the, the coordinators needs to talk to the GTM, if you're running a proxy, it's going to connect locally. And if, say, you have a thousand concurrent users all trying to do something, proxy will proxy it all up and send it as a single network request instead of sending it as a thousand. Um, so basically, this is where it lays out um, the coordinator. Again, that's your gatekeeper. Everything else, everything goes through that. Um, the data nodes, we call them the nodes down at the bottom. Essentially, base Postgres, and the GTM is really where all the magic happens. Um, so that's uh, th that that's where the majority of the work that's been done um, by folks uh, over at NTT. Pavan did a ton of work on the GTM back in the day. Um, in order to be able to get that rock solid, in order to be able to get me that consistent view across everything. Um, a lot of ways, if, if you're familiar with the Google Spanner project uh, about that paper that they put out, um, if you actually read through the paper, it, a lot of this stuff overlaps with what's going on with XC, but it, where Google Spanner is allows you to do everything geographically dispersed, they're maintaining essentially those global transaction IDs through uh, a timestamp they're doing through the atomic clocks and, and different things like that. Um, it's essentially the same thing as a GTM. So if you were going to replace a GTM with and put atomic clocks all over the place that we could read off of, you could essentially d accomplish the same thing and have it geographically dispersed just by swapping out the GTM, because that's really where it's going to happen. So you could essentially have your GTM proxies give you back real transaction ID, global transaction IDs based on the atomic clock that stuff that, that Google does with Google Spanner. Um, so it's, it's not quite there yet, but it definitely if that was something that you know, was needed in the future, essentially that's the piece of code you'd swap out 
in order to be able to get, be able to get that consistency across uh, geographic boundaries. The data distribution. This is what uh, Bruce was kind of mentioning about pre-sharding. When you're creating your tables inside of Postgres XC, you have the option to replicate them or distribute them. Uh, replication is not for high availability. It's really for performance. Um, you know, what, what that'll do is if you have your table that's replicated, it's going to do a two-phase commit across all your your nodes and insert the data across all the no data nodes so this way you have exact copies across everything. Distributing your tables, you have different distribution uh, concepts, whether it's going to be a hash, a round robin, or a modulo. So this way you'll essentially shard your data across everything. Okay, so wh which one would you use each one for? Go ahead. You, no, no, it's, it's, it's either on or off. You can, within the distribution, you can say, I'm going dis to dis distribute across you know, five of the ten nodes. You can do that and just distribute over a few of them. But when you replicate it, it's replicated across all of them. Again, it's not for high availability. It's for performance because you want to join to that table. So that's for static lookup tables, country codes, state codes, things that don't change all the time but you join to all the time. You want to replicate those. This way, all the joins to those tables are all done locally on the data nodes. We don't have to pull, pull the data back to the coordinator and do extra work on the coordinator. Distri 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 distributed tables um, is <laughs> it's that little tip you gave me. Um, that's really where you get the, the automatic sharding. So any sort of transaction tables, that you're going to split up across all your different data nodes. And each one of them is going to have a portion of the overall data. And when you distribute the tables, you want to do it, um, it'll do it automatically for you, but you want to do it in you know, some sort of uh, logical way. Uh, so this way all the data that you would li likely join together is all on the same physical node. So say you have a user table and an address table. Instead of running it all in one giant table with 400 columns, you're going to split that into really a pr parent and child um, that might have a user ID common between them. You'll distribute both of those tables by user ID, so you might have one user record and five address records uh, that are spread across all the nodes, but those joins that you always do are always on the same physical machine. And that, that'll let you push down the joins to the local data nodes. Um, also, we, it, it, lets, it lets you push down the where clauses, um, and the, the real, really simple aggregates are done in parallel. Things like sums. Um, I don't think averages are, um, because that really is, you can't, you know, average averages and get the right answer. Um, right. Okay. Uh, average might be. Some of the other ones might be. Yeah, it, it's Stato, Stato does that and pushes it down. I don't know if XC, the version that's out there right now, pushes down an average. Right. It might be in 1.1, um, which is like the current head, but I don't, I don't know if average is pushed down yet, because it, it does do that. Uh, that's the, you push down the, you pull back the sum of the sum and the sum of the counts and do the division. Um, I, I don't think 1.0 XC does that just yet. Um, it, it just was real basic parallelization. So the, w the way to get that distribution is there's a little extra syntactic sugar after your create table statements of having a distribute by clause. Um, there you can say hash, modulo, round robin, or replication. Um, if you don't put that in there, uh, XC is going to try to pick a distribution key for you. So the first thing it's going to try is a primary key. So if you have a primary key that's defined inside your create table statement, it's going to try to use that first, as long as it's not you know, a byte A or something like that, or, 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 or Boolean. Right, then it, um, after that, it's going to try to pick any other unique keys. Um, and it, it's also going to look at your foreign keys. So if you were creating your address table and you didn't do that, but ha inside there is defined a foreign key back to the user table, it's going to create that as its, um, as its hash uh, distribution key. Right, and if you say nothing and there's really no definition there, it's just going to pick the first column. Right, so it's going to try to shard everything by default. 
So, but when you're doing that, the most expensive thing that happens in Postgres XC is that join pushdown. Um, so, so this way, if you, do, if you push down the joins, you're going to get a lot better performance. If you have to pull the data back and have the coordinator do the join locally for you, you're going to get some pretty terrible performance. So you want to be able to make sure as much work is done down on the data nodes as possible. Um, so when you're picking your distribution keys, that's really where it comes into play. So if you're doing round robins uh, as your distribution key, you're never going to push down any joins. Essentially, you only want to do that is if you want to equally distribute your data across a bunch of data nodes. And essentially, you're, you have one table that you just want to spread out. Um, if you're joining to a replicated table, it's going to push that down. Um, or if you're joining two replicated tables, it's going to push down everything for you. So if you have some sort of mix between the two, um, that's where the optimizer is going to look to see whether or not you could actually push that join down. It knows whether or not the, the data is supposed to be on the same physical data nodes or not. And if it is, it's going to push that down that join um, and not have to pull back nearly as much data back to the, the coordinators. So constraints. Um, XC doesn't have global constraints. Right, so, so being able to have a unique key across data nodes. The only way that it, that could happen is if your unique key is also your distribution key. So a primary key is a perfect example, and that's what you're distributing by. Um, right now, you can't have multiple unique keys on a single table. So you can't have you know, email address and you know, your, your user ID on there at the same time. Um, it has no way to enforce that uniqueness across it. Um, so the only way to do that is if you have replicated tables, and that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, that's one of the things that's going to be worked on for 1.1. Um, I don't know if that's going to get in for 1.1, but it's kind of a, an important feature for, for a lot of applications. <coughs> yeah, we've done some hacky things where essentially we're creating another um, column in there that might have multiple things in there th to do it, but really, there's really no good way to do it. Right? Um, it and there's really no reason to really try to fake it. Right? It's, um, we, what we've done sometimes is create another table that's replicated by that and try to essentially do a rule, because we don't have triggers yet, um, that I'll insert into both places, and then I'll throw back the error for you, um, essentially as a, another unique constraint. Um, kind of sucks. Um, so that's one of the, the big downsides of it right now. But if you're comparing that against the NoSQL databases that really has nothing like that, you're still winning. At least you have one unique constraint. <laughs> so transaction management. This is the, the cool part about XC. Um, just for those of you that don't understand or, or aren't that familiar with Postgres's multi-version concurrency control. We'll spend a, a real quick second on it. It's one of the real thing, great things that allows Postgres to scale with many concurrent users uh, uh, is multi-version concurrency control. You're not locking stuff as you're reading. And as you're writing, you're not locking other people fro uh, fr from writing or reading. So this way, essentially, as long as you're not um, touching the same data, nobody's waiting for you. Um, so that allows you to be inserting data and somebody else to be reading off that same table at the same time and get a consistent view of the data based on when they start their transaction. Um, and everything is ordered inside of Postgres by its transaction ID. Um, so that the transaction IDs govern whether or not you get to see the data or not. So just as a real quick example, you have four transactions running. Um, you know, T1 does a begin, T2 begin, insert, commit. T3 starts up another transaction, and T4 um, does a select. Uh, T4 will be able to see that the snapshot, there's a snapshot for T1 and T3. It's only going to be able to see T2's data, right? Because it doesn't know about all the rest of the stuff. That transaction's been done uh, about T1 and T3. Right? So what happens when you have more than one node going and being able to get consistency across that? Uh, that's where it gets a little tricky. Um, you know, you could have some sort of federation tool over top of it and be able to insert and so select and insert data across those different um, databases. But 
unless you have some sort of consistency across those nodes from the transaction standpoint, you're going to get back the wrong data based on, you're not going to get a consistent view of that data. So if uh, node one does the, the T2's commit and then it does a select, and node two does it in the, after it does the select kind of, and then the, really the commit on T2 happens on the other node, you're going to get inconsistent data coming back. Um, if there's nothing there coordinating where the transactions are happening. So this way you do lose that C inside the, the assets. And again, that's where the global transaction manager kind of takes over. Th whenever Postgres needs a transaction ID, instead of running it locally inside the local instance, it asks the transaction manager for all that information. That's, that's really what allows XC to give you that consistency across all those different servers. Right. And then, it, it ha again, it handles all the rest of the stuff, uh, like snapshots. Also with transaction management, you have a funny look on your face. <laughs> um, it does use two-phase commits in order to guarantee everything's consistent when, when you have to insert stuff across multiple nodes. Um, if you're just inserting a single row and it goes onto a single, ser uh, single server, it's not going to do any two-phase commits. If you're insert doing an update and you have to do an update that hits all the data inside your table, it's going to do a two-phase commit across all of them wait for them all to come back, and then it's going to finally commit it. Question. Yeah? So when you do your updates, I just want to ask, it's a big copy of the data. Mm -hmm. um, so all my writes, uh, I can commit one to or two, and then it'll do it here. Yep, right. But if I wanted to have specific functions that I needed to run, because I have the same data from all the nodes, I can connect my backup, right? To the data now? It is, but then you could hose up your data. Well, no, I'm not talking about right data. You can only yeah. use right data. Yeah. You could do like row mm -hmm. or select on the same thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So if, if you're not, if you. One node fails, is it going to roll back all the CPC transactions that continue? Or does it, it go uncracked? It, ret it returns back, it fail rolls back all of them that were in that running transaction. Okay. Um, and then if you happen to try it again, and all of a sudden your high availability kicked in and there, uh, the, the backup kicked in, right, it'll happily take it. Yeah, t today it absolutely is fixed. Um, if you want to, you know, double the size, you have to basically export all your data and put it back in, in order to be able to do that. There's no exactly. You do a PG dump and PG restart. Absolutely. Um, what we generally do in production scenarios is what we try to anticipate a little bit of what the growth is. Um, say that your your cluster is going to 4x in size. Essentially, what you do is you pre configure each physical machine with four data nodes running on it. So this way, essentially, what you're doing is you do a PG-based backup. You pull it over there, you turn that one back on, and you repoint the IP addresses, and you're up and going. Um, you know, we, if you do something with the high availability stuff that, that we use, essentially, it's just a failover over to another node. So it's really a momentary blip um, if you want to be able to do that sort of thing. But yeah, there's no right now, there's no redistribution. That will be in 1.1. It's very slow. Essentially, what it's doing is a mini PG dump and PG restore behind the covers, essentially. Live, right? It is live. Yeah, right, right. It is live. Um, that'll let you do that. Um, but the version that's out there right now doesn't have it. By this summer, it should. Good. So, uh, you basically indicated that this is just the growth scalability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's your transaction tables essentially. So your your you know, if you're Walmart, your sale transactions, right? That will have you know, millions and millions of them a day. That you want to be able to scale that. It, it's also scalable for lots of small singleton reads, right? Where you have a primary key lookup, unique key lookup. It's not really for big analytical queries, but. So it's going to be scalable for any of your Django web. Exactly. Django, Ruby on Rails, Drupal. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You don't you don't have to worry about replicating and using PG pool. You get that, you know, that way. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know that that's really what it's for. Even if it's something more that changes more often than um, you know your you know state name, it could be your, your list of products or something like that. It might change it daily, but it's not performance related, uh, right? Um, you know, it's it's definitely something. Uh, but your inventory, which you want really fast, you want that distributed. But that's going to join to your product table based on SKU or something like that. So some things to worry about. Um, because the GTM is that single version of truth, um, that be can become a bottleneck for you. Um, it's CPU bound um, and network bound. When you say CPU bound, you mean bound to the core? No, it's multi-threaded. So uh, it, it, we've run it on a 16-core box. It uses all 16 cores, consumes it fairly nicely. Um, we we haven't. We haven't bottlenecked the CPU on it, though, as much as we tried. We, we've always hit the network before we hit the, the CPU, um, even with uh, even with InfiniBand, believe it or not. Um, Yeah, 
got 10,000 concurrent users running something like uh, PG Bench, beating the hell out of it. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it's pushed really, really hard um, before you hit that port thing. And 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 really, the network stuff. Once we made some uh, kernel changes, kernel, uh, kernel configuration changes, that kind of went away a little bit too. Um, so we. Th that's really where the bottleneck we see is being first, um, but we haven't really hit it in a real-world scenario just yet, um, which is why we have the, the proxy, though, anticipating that, that piece of just because that network is becomes the bottleneck the quickest, the proxy cuts, cuts down a lot on the, the network traffic, you know, grouping together a lot of the transactions all together. got all these transactions I'm waiting a, a few microseconds I'm bundling them up and, and sending them all in one one batch yeah. right kind of how we do the uh, stuff flushing out the disk with the the, the group commit right. yeah, same, same I think we even took some of the code from that piece <laughs> of it. Right. Right, same, same logic so high availability this is uh, because everything you know it's essentially your one of your data nodes goes down, um, this is where you know, essentially the whole cluster could go down. Um, th there's three things that you have to worry about making sure that's highly available. One, the most important is your global transaction manager. Um, there could only be a single one of those running, um, but what you can do is run multiple of them as GTM standbys. Essentially what's gonna happen is the main GTM is gonna replicate out to the GTM standby um, anytime it's doing any granting any sort of transaction. So this way it is essentially a synch uh, synchronous replica. It's essentially its own code borrowed heavily from Postgres code. Right, and so it, like it, it's basically a lot of it's from the proc array code inside of Postgres. Um, and then we're just um, essentially every time we're incrementing a transaction ID, we're telling the standby, hey, this is where we're at now. Essentially, th so that piece of it is very low bandwidth, um, and that's how you're handling the high availability there. Um, so this way, if the GTM goes down, we're just failing over. Um, yeah, that's my. Sorry. Get a sales call there. Can you repeat the question? Um, surprisingly, no, it's not. What? <laughs> yeah. So you're basically running the GTM in the web same block. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, a patch actually just that went in a couple of days ago in order to flush it out the disk. That one wasn't that bad. <laughs> um, really, with having the GTM standby being a synchronous replica, and you could have multiple of that. That's the, that's the what we're doing right now, right? So we're not going to backtrack that. <laughs> um, so it essentially what it, it does is it just flushes it out periodically saying I'm here uh, I yeah yeah it would never no. nope um, again 1.0 software right. um, the, the coordinators are fairly easy for high availability right? they're all peers doesn't matter which one you connect to um, you know, it doesn't matter if they're all there or not. Um, it doesn't doesn't care. So if you have some sort of load balancing in front of it, um, that could bounce between the different IP addresses. You set up a virtual IP that could kind of bounce across between all of them. It's all uh, that's fairly easy in order for high availability. You just connect to any of them; it's all good. Um, for the data nodes, what we do is we actually use uh, the inbuilt uh, synchronous replication. So and we're replicating out to the other data nodes. So essentially each one of them is peer to one another. I was going to ask, so you're using the standard hot standby sync Yep. Out to two. So you don't have any way to get to the next node. So you have, you have right. one node with sync rep, mm -hmm. you have another node with sync rep. Mm -hmm. We have no way to know that if this node goes down, it is the exact same transaction that this node with its own sync rep would have. Because the sync rep right. Yeah, whether or not it's flushed out. Right. You know, you're guaranteed that it's identical. 
Yeah, no. There is, uh, we're using to right. Well, I'm just trying to understand when you say, is that limitation there? Yeah, it's the same. Postgres is synchronous replication, absolutely. Right? And we're re replicating it out to two, uh, two other servers. So I, didn't aw I wasn't aware that that's a limitation of it. Okay. But yeah, that's, that's how, how we do it. And you s we're what we normally do is using Core Sync uh, and Pacemaker in order to do the automatic failover with virtual IP addresses. So this way, it's yeah. it does work really, really well. Um, so essentially, you know, in this particular scenario of those five servers, each one of them is running three Postgres databases on it, um, one master, two slaves. Um, and in the event of anything goes down, it's automatically going to fail over the coordinators. Um, any in-flight transactions will fail, um, and then when it'll reconnect, it'll go ahead and uh, reconnect to that virtual IP address out to the other other slave that failed over, um, and away you go. So where we are now, um, we're at version 1.0.2. Um, so we've fixed a lot of bugs. Um, it's based on Postgres 9.1. Get that, get it off of SourceForge. Um, try it out. Um, we need testers. Um, you know, that's, uh, it is a 1.0 product. It works really, really well. Um, but at the same time, the more people are using it, we said, oh, we didn't think of people using it that way. So there's different things that, that would need to be done. Okay. Documentation is a, uh, a big thing. There is a fair amount of documentation there, but it was written by the folks over in Japan. Um, whose English is their second language, so it needs some help. The documentation is a great brief reference to any of the new um, systems. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, a whole lot of it. Right. Okay. So, yeah. 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 Well, some of it just pieces of it need to be rewritten just because of. You know, it is a little bit, you know, English is a second language. That's what happens, right? If I had to write something in Japanese, it's a lot better than what how they did in English. I'm not complaining. Uh, um, so uh, it, it at least something there. But, yeah, it's, uh, even if you were kind of going through it and wanted to install it for yourself, take notes, help with the documentation that way. Um, it's a great way to give back to the project. Um, one that one, um, probably be beta in May. The, the goal is to have something out for uh, PGCon. Um, the big thing is it layering it over 9.2. Uh, that's where we're going to have the data redistribution stuff. So this way, you, when you want to add additional nodes or if you want to make something you know, distributed by a different key. The online server addition, so this way you can add mo more data nodes um, and be able to take advantage of them. Uh, triggers. Triggers don't exist in 1.0. They're going to be there in 1.1. Um, and some additional cross-node stuff. And global constraints, the way it looks like that, that might not make it in, in the 1.1. Still some hope that it might, but uh, don't know if it will or not. Okay. Any questions? Um, yeah. I got two questions. Okay. Uh, first question, are these slides available online? Not yet, but they will be. Really? Uh, I'll probably put them up on slide share, and then I'll have Joe send them out to everybody. basically the same thing we always battled at EDB, right? It's right. always a little bit behind. Yeah. Um, the, the optimizer is different enough that it's, uh, you actually have to look at the code and see what changed. Um, and and it, it's not just an automatic process. Some of it goes quick um, with, you know, you can get and stuff like that. There's some of it goes really fast, but really when it comes to the optimizer, it's a manual process to look to see what changed. What did, what did Tom change in the last version that made it go a lot faster? And can we apply that to XE? Right, so it is, you know, time consuming. Um, the third question, uh, I'm trying to understand uh, the link between the two systems and the um, if they just find some use out of mm -hmm. it and the where it needs to go in. Um, I'm trying to understand how the sort of load balancer node tools feature wise I can't put that on top of XE and understand. I understand you may be 
how would you get PG pool to work with XE, no, or, or no, what's the differences? PG pool has sort of a low balancing mode, right? And it does it basically when you're starting and yeah. it's going to come down. It's how is that? This is that, that yeah that so yeah that's it's gonna grab th that doesn't because then each one of those Postgres databases are independent, so there's no consistency across them. So if you were, um, you could get essentially that example I had with MVPC, they're independent of one another, and you could say the timestamps are different on one server versus another. You're not going to get a consistent timestamp that you're inserting into your table uh, when you do. Right, or even if you're inserting rows and you might have a default of the current timestamp for when you're inserting a your row, you're going to get a different version across all those things unless you have uh, all your data. Uh, you the ones that you don't shard. Or, or, or the ones you do shard, even. Well, <laughs> this is a, um, as someone who has been heavily involved with Quark in the past, mm -hmm. um, I find that developing a community around Quark and Tenant Project is demonstrably difficult, if not impossible. Right. Um, what is, is there a plan or a hope or a goal or an aspiration of any kind that we would be able to merge these two, the, these two technologies? And the reason yeah. I ask is one, because it would make Postgres that much cooler. Right. Uh, and two, it would make Postgres XC that much more viable. Right. Um, I've talked about it with a few of the folks. I haven't really talked with the DNTT folks. Um, looking at the code base, and if we add a couple more, um, essentially, plug-in points inside of Postgres, we could essentially make XC a plug-in, right, where it might be, you know, replace the optimizers and things like that. Um, so this way you could run off of vanilla Postgres code and drop in the libraries for XC. So, I mean, actually, in pursuit of that, there's already, I mean, we've got, we have portable snapshots mm -hmm. in, in Postgres, um, and we seem to have been talking about making the VPN more flexible. Right. So yeah, that, that's the easiest one to do. Yeah. The, um, so, so then the other thing that's left is the optimizer. Right, right. And that, that you could, Postgres, you could already replace the optimizer. Right. So it's... It's just a matter of you know, that w that maintenance of that would be fairly large to do, um, but yeah, it, we definitely that's at least what I've been talking about with a few of the folks um, that that's the way to make it so this way we're not always a version or two behind is make well, it a plugin. Well, the, other, the other thing is uh, is you have to look at the goal plans because a lot of people you start out on one virtual server mm -hmm. and then your application becomes successful and then you discover that one virtual server isn't enough for you right. and you want to but you want to expand without necessarily needing to, oh, we'll go to build a new cluster and we're going to put all of the data over it. Right. Well, the, the thing that I see is that, yes, it solves the version behind problem, mm -hmm. but when it, this is not something that needs to be a divisive thing. Like no. It doesn't fit necessarily in any of the scopes. It's something that should be integrated, should be contrib or yeah. fiction or whatever, um, and thus we're combining the community and, and, and pulling the resources because obviously we have a lot of really smart people in XC. And they're going to come home. Right. So, getting all of that together could be very uh, useful. Absolutely, and I, I think it was done the right way as a fork in the beginning, as a proof of concept to make sure this works. Um, and I think the long-term growth is how do we do integrate it back in there. Uh, that's that's part of the reason why the license of it was changed from LGPL out to the Postgres license like a year and a half ago. So with the ideas of being able to merge at least parts of that back into Postgres and being able to play nicer with the Postgres community as a whole. Um, it's uh, I I don't I think right now we have to worry more about adding features that are more useful for people in order to get critical mass to make sure that this really makes sense. Um, and you know it is a chicken or egg. If it was a contrib module or an extension on top of Postgres, we'd get more users, right? Um, but you st I think it still needs to get a, a few more production customers on there saying, yes, this is a long-term thing, let's do it, um, let's take the effort and turn
stepped out from the main Postgres stuff. So this way, uh, you could clearly see every bit of code that they've ever changed in different, instead of bringing up a diff tool. Um, it's really easy to do. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, so so it's, the idea was there in the beginning. It's just when's the right time to say, okay, we're going to divert this whole next development cycle into changing our deployment architecture in as an extension instead of a standalone binary or set of binaries. Any other questions? Uh, the, the mailing lists are fairly active, but they don't really have much of a web presence there. advocacy piece of it is definitely lacking. It is an, uh, an active project with a lot of people from different companies all submitting uh, submitting stu uh, patches out to it. It's just that progress doesn't show up on that website. That website is fairly static. There's just some indicator that you know, when you go to the main website that it is active. Maybe yeah. a list of the archives out to the mailing list or something like that yeah. might maybe. Yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys.